is presented. I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Second. So moved to second it to approve the agenda as submitted. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Okay. Comment board policy 213. Um, anybody? Public. Consent agenda. Questions or changes there? Right now, I accept a motion. Move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. So moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 It's have it. Motion carries. Okay. So we have a budget public hearing for the proposed budget. Um, so we'll open that at 6. 31 and 45 seconds. I didn't see anybody sign up on the sheet. Sign up just just sign up. Okay. So and we did not receive, we any, receive any written or any other things. Okay. We'll close it at 632. Discussion items. Facilities assessment report. GLR. So we have, we have guests here to share our uh, a portion of the facilities assessment. And let Eric and Connor take it from here. Yeah, we got that you guys need You want to present something? Yeah. I can just send you the link to the whole team. You can do that. Or do you want to put it on? I'll just give it to you here. Okay. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you guys getting plugged up, plugged in. Um, just give you a little background here. So, uh, in relation to overall facilities, uh, district uh, asked us to look at um, just kind of what your what I'll call deferred maintenance type things are. So, you guys have done a great job of uh, you know, updating your um, academic and educational facilities over the last few years. Um, and uh, so now it's time to just kind of look holistically at, at the district. What's what's remaining? What's left to do? Um, and uh, and uh, you know how do you budget for that uh, going forward in, in the overall plan? So well, you just gave a presentation. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> so just uh, as a reminder, here this is our team. Uh, Myself, Eric Barron, uh, Connor Gatsky here, uh, as well as the engineers that we have on staff uh, looking at your facilities, doing walkthroughs, um, and uh, so they've got interviews with Brian and the like, So, um, so just look, anytime somebody picks this up, right, and whether it's you, the district, or uh, you know anybody that comes after you, it's just kind of like to give you some background information. So this is always a little fun. So just show your boundaries of where, of where you're at. Um, how much uh, area you cover. And then this is um, just kind of fun to show you in related to uh, your district itself, um, where your facilities are, so that um, if people can understand the, the amount of ground that you cover. Um, so um, just as a quick note here, but we did not evaluate what use because that is your newest facility. So that should be, you know, all, all taken care of. It's so it goes for uh, Crossroads as well. We did do that, so both brand new. Should be. I think I got it. So, at least for what? Yes. <laughs> so, as an overview, just to kind of tell you, like how we how we do things. Um, um, what we do is there are thirteen categories that we uh, that we review, and I know this is a little bit small here. We're going to get into. Uh, we'll show you kind of a, 
um, that we did the presentation here in a second. But um, there's 13 different categories that we uh, that we look at for every facility, and it's everything from you know carpet and ceilings and interior finishes to concrete to structural systems, lighting, HVAC, all of that. So it's very comprehensive across the board. And then what we do is all of your buildings there are lined up uh, to the right. Um, and just like in school, you get, a, you get a report card, right? You get a grade uh, for how you do in each one of those categories. So based on um, based on our methodology and the data that we input to that, um, that then uh, gives basically every building a grade. And you will see that as we go forward in, in how we uh, how we create each of the facilities. Um, just for kind of baseline here, you can see now you can kind of read there everything from site to exterior structure, roof, interior, uh, PDA, um, safety things, electrical, HVC, plumbing, and technology. Um, just kind of a good, better, best, right? Or better, best. Um, you know, for for benchmarking your uh, ledges building, and you know, that's best. It's in good condition. It's the best condition that it, it will be in. Um, and then things kind of go down from there. And so just because it may be red or poor doesn't mean that you have a poor district, right? Or that you're not taking care of your facilities. It's just a reflection in uh, in comparison perspective to the other facilities that you have that it may need some attention. So I would like to clarify that because if you, know, you will see some red this evening um, and people think, well, oh my gosh, you know, it's you know, the end of the world and, and everything. And uh, sometimes it does, right, for some districts, but. But you guys do a really good job on your maintenance and, and where you are uh, uh, it's in through your facilities. Uh, this is again a uh, kind of perspective. And fine. So you can you can see here uh, the categories of, that I mentioned that we talked about uh, just in, in uh, written text form. I understand some people are visit visual and graphical, some people can like to read it out. So into the assessment. So this is holistically here. Um, you're kind of getting a wrap up summary. We'll go through each building a little bit more okay, a little bit more kind of detail here. But you can see what we do is um, we measured your academic, your educational facilities, and then we've looked at the district operational facilities. So we've kind of broken it apart in that way. And then we've given you a holistic district average um, and then measured each facility um, you know, as, as a standalone component. When you look at the bottom there and you, you go across again ledges and crossroads they're at the peak of their of their life right so they would uh be at a five and then everything from there um you know kind of kind of trails down and so as a district right now you're sitting at about 3.5 that's not a bad score overall but you can obviously see on the on the chart here when you average things that there's a, there's a reason why that the district average would tend lower while most of your academic facilities are in that in that upper green um, green category, we're going to focus a little bit later more on the gap and reveal the maintenance and the bus garage component. Um, just some things that may may come to mind, or you know, like you look at this and say, "My gosh, we had all greens there," but like on Franklin, uh, you know, we had a two point three in there, and it looks like it's turning red. It just shows you again in comparison to the facility and the and getting the life cycle of some things like roofing, right? You have a roof there that's that's age, it's meant that it's life expensive, and uh and you would budget for that. And once that gets changed out, that would be green and, and your average would go up. Um, same thing at Boone, Boone Middle School. Um that that uh, while that facility is in great condition overall. Uh, again, you're coming near the end of some of the, you know, uh, uh, warranties and, and timelines there. And so it's time to look at that. Um, the same thing with safety and security. Um, you have very safe facilities. Um, what we're addressing there is just a change in kind of the philosophy of how uh, security has been handled at, at school facilities in the last five to 10 years, right? There's a lot more focus on um, on the approach and how you do things and some of the passive and active systems. I'm not gonna talk in depth and detail here just for the benefit of the, uh, of the board and the community, um, not, to, not to tip anything off. But um, but again, there's some things there that, that we can do um, to enhance the, the systems that you've already got in place at other, at other buildings, right? So then looking a little bit further down the road, um, get the your field, um, the maintenance facility and bus garage. You'll notice that I put um, Giffinger Field in the academic educational facilities portion. 
Um, and and that is true. Um, it really serves two uh, two kind of components. One is um, the academics of PE, right, of gym, but it also takes care of um, the uh, you know the activities portion. So after you know after hours, um, all of your sports. And I've always considered, um, you know, sporting uh, events and stuff as much an educational activity, you know, with coaching and, you know, the life lessons that are learned on the field as much as they are in the classroom. So that's why we put those together in that academic, academic uh, portion. Um, and if you go down the line, we did not assign years to them here, but uh, you have spent, you know, a lot of dollars in high school, the middle school, Franklin over the years, and then most recently with uh, Legends and Crossroads. So. Kudos to you on on uh, kind of executing the, the plan, the master plan, and uh, you know it's time to kind of take the next step, right? So as we get into uh, you know the, the the red ones there, um, we'll talk a little bit more about as as we as we go on. But next slide. So this is a district wide facilities average. Now taking kind of those numbers and showing you in a graphical form how things uh, kind of uh, go across the board. <laughs> the um, you know, from a structure standpoint, all of our facilities are structurally sound, they're in good condition. That's why it gets the highest rating. Um, it's hard to achieve a five unless the building is brand new. That's just kind of the way the way that the structure is set up. But across, again, across the, the, the rest of the district there, um, you know, you're, you're doing well. Um, roofing, that's the low one. Um, HVAC, that's just a constant, you know, constant thing with, uh, with how um, how codes are and how, um, how your systems are, are operating. Um, they they get aged. So. All right. So first uh, building would be Franklin Elementary. Um, so uh, with this, you guys have done um, multiple renovations and you have continued work that you're already doing in that facility, which we've taken into account. Um, there are a few things that we do want to highlight, um, especially pertaining to the exterior and some roofing needs. Um, so that's going to be reflected in this graph that you show here, um, that you see here. So um, on the outside, um, so particularly in the gym area, the ethos that you have kind of around um, on the exterior walls needs a little bit of attention. Um, there's some cracking and some of that is going to compromise the um, exterior envelope and start to allow moisture if it's not addressed. Um, <laughs> Same goes for um, some of the software work that you see there at the main entry. Um, but interior wise, um, you've got some uh, continued improvements with uh, carpet ceiling um, replacements that you guys have uh, been working on, uh, which is reflected in here. Um, and then obviously some of the site constraints that you have um, with your site circulation, um, there's some items that need to be uh, addressed with what's that road directly. Um, so uh, a little bit of rework there, um, but it is relatively constrained site, so there may be some opportunity to try and rework uh, some small pieces of that. So for those that were around um, when we did the renovation for that, um, you may not you may not realize, but that's actually City Street there. So the city owns that, and they worked in partnership with the school district to um, to provide that uh, that access for you uh, to kind of create the drop off and turn around. Um, the the issue that that Connor is talking most specifically about is on the very left hand side, uh, right down here. We have some uh, service traffic and things that are making it uh, a little bit hard to enter on that roundabout. Uh, so I don't think that's um, I don't think that's too hard to overcome, uh, and especially now. Uh, looking at the different sizes of vehicles that are you know, coming there and, and servicing the facility, um, just having to work with the city a little bit on, on making a touch week there. So, yeah. and then the last thing I would note on here is um, some uh, playground notes as far as uh, surfacing needs or um, inclusive um, equipment. Um, yeah. So, on the next slide, you're going to see some costs here. They're going to be before everybody falls off their chair. <laughs> um, let me explain why and how we get to these numbers. So in that report card, everything that we have um, identifying there, we have the ability to kind of map that out as, as uh, one of these categories here. So priority one, priority two, priority three, four. Okay? And you'll see right after that, it shows what something may be considered immediate, 
um, maybe dealing with in a year one, um, and then years two to 10 and 10 to 20. This is meant to be high level. This is not meant to be, um, you know, count to the nitty gritty of every electrical outlet, every door handle. So um, there is some, um, there's a little bit of liberty taken um, in how uh, in how things are, are identified and quantities of things, okay? So the second piece of that is um, looking at um, how do we, uh, you know, even in year one, you got kind of a big gap sometimes where maybe uh, making a decision where between year one and year five, right? So it kind of falls in between some of those categories. A lot of things on here, especially as you get as you get further out, are just life cycle things. So when you're talking about uh, roofs and mechanical equipment, you know, everything has a, a life cycle to it. So some of those things are in here that you would do on a normal basis anyway. You're just seeing it holistically as one big number, which then scares everybody into you know understanding like, oh my, we got I thought we just made our improvement to the building. You did, and things are good. But again, some of these things are falling out of life cycle costs that you would be taking care of anybody. For instance, you're doing carpet replacement in right now, and you're probably spending a pretty penny to do that. But that's that's just part of the part of the uh, the maintenance uh, uh, criteria that you would have for any building. Okay. The other thing is um, we're showing uh, estimated uh, construction values. In the in the priority cost there, and if you add those up, you know, so you do not add up to ten million. We're trying to account for some uh, soft costs. Not everything will have soft costs associated with it, whether it's design engineering fees, contingencies, um, you know, uh, uh, permits, and things like that. You actually need with the city or other other agencies. So we just apply a factor, uh, a percentage factor to that um, to help you, uh, you know, gauge as you making the budget for all of your. All of your maintenance okay those are today's dollars as well and these are yes these are in today's dollars um we try to account for a little bit for um you know some inflationary period between you know what, now and, and maybe uh 12 months from now but as everybody knows um we are in kind of a hyper you know hyper inflation mode um and so uh yeah, that's that's another thing that's contributing to the overall uh overall numbers here so as a wrap up um to to this facility um, just some some major considerations again, overarching and high uh, high level here. Roof replacement is is, uh, is number one. Uh, I, I think that should be you know done sooner than later. So we talked about the service drive improvements, um, playground equipment. You know while the equipment itself um, you know is is in generally good condition. Again, looking at an either inclusive play and or meeting some ADA things uh, where you got you know mulch uh, there may not be uh, as accessible for. Uh, for those uh, you know, wheelchairs or crutches, things of that nature. Dick Gym Wall, we talked about that. Um, some soffit replacement, and uh, and then just generally positive interior, interior lighting upgrades to uh, um, to more uh, more efficient LED lighting. So, okay. Uh, the next facility we looked at was the middle school, and again, uh, this the, the facility itself. Um, so, two thousand, let's see, two thousand three. Um, and then we did an addition in there in 2009 when we brought the fifth grade um, over from Franklin. That was about the same time that the Franklin project was done. So again, great facility. Um, you know, it's, it's serving the needs of, of the district. Um, but again, there are some things that are uh, that are showing that wear and tear. Specifically, again here uh, at roof. Um, you know, when you're looking at a facility, uh, the average lifespan of your warranties are generally in the 20 year range. Um, you can have roofs that go beyond that, that's fine. But just again, paying attention to you know seams or if you start to have developed roof leaks and things like that, that's a sign that, that we should we should get on a, a regular plan to, to change those out. And whether you decide to do it all at once or whether you do it at kind of a, you know, an interval so that you have you know, a rotating schedule for a facility, um, there's there's pros and cons to each one of that. Okay. Um, so, you know, looking at this facility here, um, again, at the, you know, very low on the immediate on the critical, you know, thing um, uh, in relation to the overall cost. Again, that has to deal with uh, when we get to life cycle costing of just planned equipment that, that we know is, is going to reach the end of its life, just because that's what it does. Uh, but uh, some of the things that we cited there really um, in our relation to, you go to the next slide, we can talk about it. Um, pedestrian walkways, 
You can kind of see on the upper left hand photo there um, some of the, the concrete condition. You've had some of the main driveway area replaced or some other parts of the, of the sidewalks replaced already, but you've got um, a fair amount of the around the bus drop off pickup area that, um, that I would be that would uh, recommend be addressed. And again, that's just kind of it's not that you've done anything drastic or bad. Uh, that's just normal wear here with throwing salt and calcium chloride and all that stuff down and meeting with an Iowa winter, right? Um, roof, roof replacements, um, secure entry, uh, you know, uh, conditions, um, interior finishes. You know, this was uh, that was cutting edge design 20, 20, 20 some years ago, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, just things get worn and things need to be refreshed, um, and that, that, that's okay. Uh, rooftop HVAC systems. Uh, you're dealing with one one component right now, which is a bit of uh, So we've got five more of those units across the roof that that will need to be dealt with um, at some time in the near future. Um, cafeteria wall. So you have a partition wall there that's in the upper right hand uh, photo. And um, some of those bearings and the, the wheel uh, mechanisms that allow that to uh, open and close, they're, uh, they're having some trouble. So uh, we recommend, uh, that's probably one of the, the early things that we recommend you to look at is again, it's kind of an issue for your staff and getting that open, closed, maintaining that. Um, and the last thing we want is for somebody to come in with a half. So, okay. Um, there was uh, to, oh, one more uh, discussion again of uh, progressing at least, you know, whether that can be added to the gym. Um, and we think, think we can do that. Uh, there has to be some structural modifications to, to assist that. But um, if we think that can occur. And then again, future future about the factories. Next building uh, would be the high school. So um, this being overall one of your newer uh, buildings, aside from the three-story, but with the uh, newer addition uh, out front. Um, so first thing that we looked at is the uh, site. So um, you guys have recently redone your parking to the Northeast and it's getting to be time to maybe start to consider those other lots as well. So um, all things as far as the surface paving um, and getting proper drainage for those as well, the exterior lighting, um, those sorts of things are gonna be in need of uh, addressing here soon. Um, but all in all, um, exterior wise, aside from that, um, things are looking pretty good and maybe some minor um, control joint uh, ceiling replacement coming soon. Um, some uh, replacement of the windows at the three-story building um, where you have not yet done so, um, and then some re-roof at that three-story building as well, um, which may get a little bit more involved just in the way that roof is constructed, but um, that will be another need um, to address some leaks that we've heard some reports of. Um, it's just it's time. So um, then, Next would be um, your activities entrance currently. Um, it sounds like there's um, a lot of uh, maybe some undesired driving that occurs at that front walkway. That's not how that paving is designed. So um, uh, we, we're not coming here with a design solution for that. We're just saying that could be a potential um, something that needs to be considered um, in the future for how you address that activities uh, entrance area. And then we already went through the window replacement, but um, the cool would be uh, coming up next as a item for consideration for several reasons. So uh, our team went through there and looked at it from an interior comfort perspective as far as the uh, temperature and humidity, which is in some need of uh, control and uh, addressing. So uh, even the general just layout isn't necessarily conducive to uh, competitions or um, your bleachers need uh, replacement, that sort of thing. Um, dated the pool deck um, is worn and it's a need of getting replaced. So um, kind of all the aspects here and there um, that, that need some attention. One of the things to recognize also in relation to the pool and the activities entrance um, is that there are some things in here that could be what I'll call design solutions, right? So with the activities entrance, whether it's way climbing or even just, you know, sprucing it up to enhance the, the overall um, uh, background of the school to match maybe the entry that you have at the main at the main entry, right? The kind of the aesthetic. 
We did not include any of like those costs in here because we don't we haven't met with you. We don't know what those things are that you want to look at that you how you want to address those. Um so um you know some people say well then you can take some of those uh uh maintenance dollars and apply that to your new solution, whatever you're doing. So it's not like you're double dipping and you're gonna double all those numbers. Some of those things would would um be taken care of through the maintenance program. Some would be taken care of through uh maybe you know uh, enhanced design. In relation to the pool, um for as long as I've worked with you guys, you know, that is a continuing ongoing conversation and discussion and probably can be a whole nother like <laughs> separate um work session. Uh, but just a recognition there that um you are trying to understand the functionality as much as the maintenance need, right? The maintenance needs um pools, you know, they 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 take water, they leak water, they <laughs> you know, there's the high humidity um, environments, um, corrosion, uh, the equipment, they're just a, a big uh, a big drain on on a, on a maintenance budget, right? Um, and just maintaining and operate uh, operating those. So it's as much of a, a philosophical question as it is, um, you know, what what does it do for you, your district, your community? So, yeah. Um, so now we're getting into some of the red, <laughs> some of the red areas here. And um, I, maybe it's a, a surprise, maybe it's not, but just looking at the conditions of the facility, um, we, we could not find any data on the year this was constructed. Um, my guess would be um, pre-1960, maybe 1950, uh, maybe even before that. <laughs> but um, the interesting thing is, you know, with, with structures like this, um, the structure itself is in relatively good condition, um, which you know, can be deceiving. And that's why, you know, we had a fund of the, the third item that are in yellow. That's why it's rating so high. It's, um, they don't build things like they used to, is what they say. <laughs> um, but the shortcomings of that is it's not insulated, you know, and uh, and overall that facility, um, in my opinion, probably doesn't meet the needs of your overall functionality with the, uh, the type of equipment that you're storing in, the quantity of equipment that you're storing in there. So those are kind of some other intangible things that, uh, that may lend yourself to decide when you uh, renovate versus create new and some of those things but um you know windows doors um roof just about everything in this facility needs some kind of tender love and care um and you guys have done great with it again uh with with the resources that you have um when we evaluate these types of buildings oftentimes um when you're running bond referendums and you're working on the academic portions of buildings the, the common uh statement is Hey, let's put all of our money into academics, right? We want to go to the students first. We want to make sure the community can see everything. And, and I think I illustrated on that very first slide there that you've done a great job with that. You have poured the dollars into your students and into the community uh, uh, places. But the danger is um, constantly neglecting, and I'm not saying that you neglected it, but constantly diverting those funds from the operational side of, of, of how you maintain your district will ultimately carry through because your staff that maintains and does a great job with your educational buildings, they may have shortcomings here that they can't do their job, uh, you know, properly, effectively. And so I hope I don't see, but you see the red and the oranges and things here. Um, you know, you're going to get to a point where uh, you, you don't invest in the, in the back end. Uh, it's going to carry through to the rest of your facilities, right? So it may be time. And this is why you do something like this to illustrate that you need We've invested, we've done all of that. Now it's time to do a little bit of something for yourself, right? Treat yourself <laughs> in, in, uh, in, in making those upgrades. So, and your other buildings too, Eric made the good point that, you know, to this point, you guys have made great strides at all your other buildings as far as um, continual maintenance and improvements that need to be done to those. And those will always exist. So, they're just there is a point where you have to consider how how to divert those to other needs as well. So, and you'll see here kind of a little bit of a, a misnomer here. I mean, it, there's there's really minimal heat in there. Um, there are plumbing systems and things. So when I look at the ten the ten to twenty year range, we didn't even really assign costs to that because I think this this building here probably needs more conversation. It needs a a bigger workshop session to understand what your real 
needs are. Um, just looking at the square footage of that facility um, and doing a one-to-one -one replacement versus um, uh, at, at today's dollars versus what you're going to afford to it in maintenance costs. Um, I think you need, I think you need this time right out of a conversation about what those dollars really look like. So again, you can see here just some of the considerations. Um, you know, the parking uh, or the the the, uh, the yard area. You've got a lot of broken concrete uh, out there. A mixture of concrete gravel. Um, you know, so even think this is in good times, but think about when it when it gets wet, you kind of the mud vessels that's there. Again, you have a good exterior structure, um, but but that's that's about it. Um, interior structural considerations with some mezzanine things that have. Uh, storage uh, areas that have come in there, uh, the the wood rafter joists. Um, I would I would call attention to maybe some programmatic and space issues of again how you're storing equipment and the quantity of equipment that you have in there. Um, HVAC systems, it, it's not heated. Um, if it is, um, you know, it's maybe just as kind of a space heater um, to kind of take care of some things. You can see the bathrooms. Um, there's some ADA considerations of this building. Um, and then, you know, HVAC, you've got, I think you've got a wood shop in here, uh, but, you know, we don't have uh, dust collection and things like that. So, uh, again, I would just have a holistic uh, conversation about what you really want this facility to be and how it can best serve the needs of the district going forward. And then your bus garage, um, I would say very similar uh, in nature to the, to the bank facility. Um, Again, you've done well with uh, with the property that you have and the resources that you have, but um, you do have some buses that are stored outside. Um, uh, you know, your your capacity is full there. Um, you've already had kind of an appendage put on uh, at the at the on the right side of there, just kind of a uh, a windbreak as you enter the facility. Um, you know the the facility as it as it stands, it's a it's a uh, it's a wood wood structured building. It's a full bar. Um, so for what it is, um, you know, the structure rates, you know, rates kind of high, but when you look at the, at the use of the facility and what it's doing, um, again, I think we should have a conversation as to whether this is really serving the needs of the district and how it continues to operate uh, in that fashion. And then as you can see to the right side of the graph there, um, you know, there's just considerations again for, um, you know, HVAC and electrical, um, all those, all those types of things within, within the so um, the other thing to consider is on the site on the site there um, you do share that property line with uh, some neighbors and so uh, you know uh, being respectful on both sides of the coin uh, what the neighbors are asking for and and what you're asking for and how buses uh, get turned around and park and where those are staged um, I think that's a that's a factor that's not necessarily facility related but um, kind of more holistic in, in how the operation of the facility Um, so again, here when you look um, holistically at the numbers, um, just on a one-for-one -one replacement, again, I would um, just ask maybe that uh, you have a larger conversation before you uh, you know, put additional dollars or significant numbers. Right? You always have kind of day-to-day -day stuff, and even in the best case, you can't just wait one and do something tomorrow. Right? There's there's a, a time lapse here uh, between when you're able to to um, execute a plan and and, and take care of things. But I would look at um, at, uh, at how you spend your dollars long term at this facility and maybe some efficiencies that you may gain. Uh, maybe even through like combining this one in your maintenance facility. Maybe there's a way that we can do that on an existing property um, that, that, uh, that we can work through. And just again, some interior photos there to see if you had not been there. And I would, I would encourage you just to take a, um, take a walk through. Um, Memory lane. There's, there's even some, uh, some very nice uh, uh, wall finishes there in the office that may, may, uh, may come in handy at the middle schools. We you know, how to create that. <laughs> Everything that's old is new again, right? <laughs> but site access, interior structure, um, yeah, shortage of space, um, ventilation, uh, interior lighting, again, just holistically, um, you know, as a good practice. And then finally here, um, get into your field. So of all the facilities, this is a little bit of an anomaly in how we, in how we uh, 
uh, age this one in relation to the other ones, where we have a very delineated map of you know mechanical systems, electrical systems, all those things. Those are all here at the field, but they're they're in a different setting than kind of a, a you know as a built environment. And so the largest thing that I would say here is you have both of them. you have both a an actual functional need of of uh, equipment and facilities. But you also have kind of that academic aspect, uh, conference aspect, how you're serving, um, you know, not only your students, but also students that come from other schools and whether or not you can host things. Um, you have a five lane track with a seven lane straightaway. That is uncommon. That is not <laughs> <laughs> um, and most districts in, in your conference or, uh, or what you aspire to be, um, it's an eight lane track with an eight lane straightaway. If you can't do that, it's a six lane track with an eight lane straightaway. If you can't do that, it's a four lane track with some combination there uh, on the straightaways. Um, like I said, you have an anomaly there, and and, and it's you know by the if you look at your site again, you're constrained right uh, of how this has been put together, um, and uh, you know where does parking happen? Um, I'm sure the city. You know, and kind of enjoys coming around on the blocks there. You got people parking just about everywhere, right? So there's some site constraints. Your electrical systems, I know you just had some lighting, uh, you know, the heads themselves may be replaced, but the poles, the structure, the technology, um, there's newer uh, and, and more efficient uh, items that, that can be uh, that can be had. Um, your bleacher structure. Um, while it's sound and it's not, you know, it's not in danger of collapsing, you do have some code issues that are related to it. Um, so those are things that, that we would want to address. Um, and then kind of a disparity too. Um, you can see in the background there on the home side, uh, the, the facility, the concession stand and restrooms compared to what the visitor side is. There's a, there's a great disparity there. So, um, you know, I'm all in favor of painting your locker rooms for the visitor team paying where you know you don't have that psychological warfare. But um but when you look at uh, just the facilities in general and offering uh to uh, to the community at large, um again I think there's some some disparities. Uh, and then just yep, yeah, you're fine. Um so then again just looking at some of the you know the conditions that you have here, um you know the, the bathroom in it uh in your in your um your team room areas uh through just offering even just a sense of privacy um ADA considerations uh both for the home team and the guest facilities um you know there's just there's just some inherent things that i think should be addressed and, and looked at um, in relation to the whole site so again the bigger conversations before before putting in major dollars to improving systems looking at um, maybe what the alternatives are and how you can um, either majorly up, up, upgrade and enhance this facility in its current location, which I would I would have some reservations to, or whether it's uh, time to, you know, to find that alternative site. And then again, as I talk with your maintenance at bus farm, are there opportunities here that with facilities that you already own um, that uh, that you could you know you could re repackage something. So So that is the conclusion of our of our report at a high level. Um, we will certainly you know provide you with kind of the detail, the backup, and everything that, that we found. Uh, but we we did want to get to you and uh, just show you you know in holistic. Um, you know, and again, you're doing a great job with your facilities. Uh, I don't want you to leave this this meeting today to say, boy, <laughs> um, you know, my home. Connor's home, your home, we all have those things that need to be addressed and taken care of. And you're no different than any other district, but I would say that with the steps that you have made, you are ahead of the game and this is this is part of the course. So yeah. happy to answer any questions that you may have or uh, commentary. Just on the correct answer sir, the rubrics as far as the zero to five. Mm -hmm. Was there a chance to go back to the roof, I guess, for like the middle school section? And that was a 2.3 or whatever it was. Yeah. Is that based on it's truly a 2.3 on your scale, or is that just due to where the five is at with ledges now? It brought it down to a two. Um, no, it's it's individually based on the on the lifespan. So again, two uh 2003 was constructed. Um, I know for a fact this so we were involved in design. It has a 20 year warranty. Those roofs are still original. So your warranty is expired as of last year. 
it doesn't mean that the roof is failing. It just means that, you know, any repair now that may have to be made is going to cost you a little bit more. Um, I've had roofs that last another five years beyond their warranty period. But again, getting into that annual, um, you know, inspection uh, uh, routine and and truly making sure that the, the system is, is still intact, um, that, that's paramount. And when you go over flank, frankly, uh, you've got a ballasted roof there. Um, that's that's a very old technology. I have not designed a ballasted roof in probably 15 years. <laughs> um, just because again, that's the that's the lowest end of the spectrum. You do have some pulling, some stretching, and some things uh, that are going on there. Uh, some leaks that are that are either have developed or are going to develop. So I would I would look at that. Um, so yeah, good question in relation to the where's the benchmark stand. Um, Five is basically brand new, and then you just work down the scale from there. Thank you. Yeah. Probably the only question I would have for you when we plan to give the board the more detailed or because later in our agenda we have work sessions we're going to try to set, and it would probably be beneficial to have that prior to work sessions. So I was just curious, kind of timeline wise, what yeah, we should really have things up here within the next week, uh, week to two weeks, um, and kind of finalize uh, the information and then deliver that to you. So, um, yeah, we're happy to come back and, and you know, it's a work session or individual, however you want to do it, uh, just to talk to the information. Um, and uh, I think that the biggest thing for this is you've taken the step uh, that a lot of other districts have not, and, and I, I applaud you for that, is now you have a, a means to take a next step, right? A lot of people are just kind of going day by day and month by month and uh, uh, you, you lay out a plan and you kind of work the plan. So the plan can evolve and that's okay. But, uh, but as long as you have a plan, um, it's easy to communicate that to the civic community and to yourself as you move forward. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Some action items. The first one is the professionals. Would like to talk with us. Yes. Hello. Hello. You can go ahead and see my slide. Hi, I'm Maddie Hiplop. Uh, I'm a senior here at Boone High. I've been involved in theater all four years of high school, and I've been in nine productions. I'm a four-year varsity letter recipient, and I'm a member of the International Thespian Society, and I'm also a 2024 IHSSA All-State Speech Participant, and I'm the only student from Boone to be selected. And I also serve as a thespian officer for our troop. I am Marshall Taylor. I am a junior, and I've been involved in theater for all three years of my high school career and lettered all three of those years. I have been involved in eight productions thus far, I'm also an inducted member of the International Thespian Society. I am also a current serving member of the State Thespian Officer Board, so one of the uh, student leaders for the State Theater Association. And I'm actually Boone's first ever chairman of the board, which is pretty exciting. And I'm also a uh, Thespian Officer here in high school. So we wanted to give you a little background on what exactly is International Thespian Festival. Which is my turn to talk about yes. actually. <laughs> uh, it's a, a week long event in Bloomington, Indiana at a uh, college campus. It takes place the very last full week of June. It is essentially a, as, as the name states, a festival, a celebration of the love of the arts for thespians from across the world, actually, not just in America. As far as I know, there's a couple of troops from China, Europe, those kind of places. And it's really just a place for those people with that love of the craft to come together and share their experiences and their knowledge and grow, not just as a community, but as a, an art form, really. And that's really the, the, the main points of the event. All right, now we get to why International Thespian Festival is such an important opportunity and so important for our school specifically. Uh, for students, we get to meet with various organizations and figures at an international level. Uh, we get to gain valuable leadership and technical skills from the multiple workshops we've been attending throughout the week, and we'd also serve as a representative for the Boone program. For our advisors who would be coming with us, there is 
another slew of opportunities, including getting to make connections with advisors in that same position from across the country, getting that insight into what other programs are doing to help uh, build their community and build their program. Additionally, just making that connection with you know, things like our uh, lighting organizations, like we have our light company, but there's other other companies, of course, and making those connections with those people is very important and very beneficial to the program overall and building that community involvement with the uh, SB society as a whole would be incredibly beneficial to the program. Additionally, there's also workshops and various uh, meetings and things for advisors to grow their skills as directors and, and as advisors for the students that they need back here. Slide. So here's kind of just a rundown of all the important information of the week how much it costs for registration. But the week that happens is June 23rd, 20th at Indiana University. And there is a few different avenues for what registration costs can look like. We listed all those there in detail, but I'll go through them quickly. There is a student's all access pass, which is $1,000 pretty much even per student, which includes access to all international testing festival activities. So workshops, main stage productions, all of that great things, as well as included dorm housing and meals with that registration cost. In addition to that, as a serving member of the state board, I would get 50% of my registration fee pre refunded to me after the upfront cost of the pay. There's also that same cost for adults. It is slightly less expensive for adults, $750 for the all access, but it gives all of those same benefits as the students all access. For the student activity pass, it costs only $700 per student. It gives us access to all ITF activities except for the late night activities. It does not include dorm housing or food. And as stated before, Marshall would get 50% back of his deposit. For the adult activity pass, it costs $550 per person, and it includes the same perks as the student activity pass. So all in all, with all of those fancy big numbers totaled up for a potential registration cost of the all access pass for the two of us and an advisor as a chaperone would be $2,750. That also is without including the $500 refund that would be given back after registration fees that are paid because of my membership as an STO. And the activities only pass totaled up would be $1,950. And again, that is without the uh, $350 refund for my 50%. And that is, again, just two students and one advisor with the caveat that that does not include the hotels or uh, meals. Registration for the event is due May 1st, but the payment itself is not due until June 12th. Thanks for financing. We're hoping to receive some help from the Green Booster Club with your guys' approval. And it'll either be, we will ask for help to cover the registration fee, so either the $2,750 or the $1,950. For any additional fees after that, we are currently working with community businesses throughout Boone asking for sponsorships, and we have actually already received one. So that is hope for the future, hopefully. <laughs> uh, if there's any questions or comments, of course, feel free. Well, I was going to ask, as the representative for Iowa, what, what did that entail? You, you touched on that pretty well. Well, um, entail in terms of uh, getting into that position? You no, or just what role? would you do? When you, when, oh. how, how would you represent Iowa? And would there be something special there? There, is, uh, there used to be an international thespian officer program, which was a step up from state thespian officer, a small group of students from across the world, actually, who would help in leaving the program. Unfortunately, that program was recently cut short this, year, uh, this past year, but it has been replaced with, I forget the acronym, the International Thespian Student Leader Council. It is, uh, they meet once a month over video call, again, student leaders from across the world, all giving their inputs and ideas. And as a state officer, I would have even more opportunities to get involved and put my input in as a, a smaller state and a smaller, uh, State troop, states, uh, organization to be a voice, essentially. He's not only representing them, but he's also representing he's the whole Thank you.
Just out of state travel. I move to approve the uh, out of state travel request as well as raising efforts. Second. 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 Now on to the FCC and National Division. Hello, a little similar to their story. Um, I'm Heidi Hicks. I'm a guest teacher here and a skill advisor at Boone. And I'm excited to introduce you to Alice. She's a freshman here at Boone. So I have qualified to go to Nationals this summer. I have hand sewn this 1890s walking ensemble. It took me over 150 hours to to complete it. But this work has paid off as I have gotten first place at both districts and state, meaning I am the only one to qualify for nationals from my um, competition. Um, yeah. So as Alex said, she qualified for nationals. And we've got a breakdown of our cost here. Um, and then you guys got to pull that they're not a screen that kind of shares. Yeah. But um, so it's got the breakdown of our class there, and Alice is requesting to be able to attend in Seattle this summer, and also to um, she's requesting to be able to fundraise for this. So she can see all the costs there, and she said this is a great opportunity for her, but it's also a really great opportunity for Boone as she pays the way. SCCLA has something really strong here. There's been a high turnover rate in SCCLA here, so we haven't really got anything going yet. Um, but our goal is to get things going, and when Alice came back from the state, the students were super excited just to see that her success in that, and they're already talking about nationals next year. So hopefully next year there's a goal group of them in here asking for out-of-state travel, but um, it's an awesome. We started with zero dollars and just the excitement of students. I know you probably all were at Package of Money and, and seen the things of that. And part, on a personal note, um, this is near and dear to my heart. I was a student at UCLA. I was actually a state officer and went to nationals every year, several years before Ryan graduated from high school. <laughs> and we actually changed the name from FHA to FCCLA back then. And it's just a really great opportunity that has affected my life, and I'm excited to turn that to students here at Boone. Any questions? Okay. Um, How many nationals? How many students are there? Um, 7,000. Um, not all of them compete. So from the state of Iowa, you have to have not only a gold rating, but also a first. So we had another student that got first place in her category, but the competition to go to nationals is really, really tough. So actually, nobody from her category qualified to go to nationals. So the fact that as a freshman, Alice qualified. I mean, you can see her project that she did was a little extreme. <laughs> um, and so it's a really big deal for her to qualify to go. Our motion. I move to uh, honor the request from Heidi Hicks to uh, accompany a student and to go to the National Leadership Conference. And to fundraise, how we can get up. I can approval for this request. Second. Second. So we would and second it to approve the request for all state travel and fundraising to fund the trip as presented. Any other discussion? And did you, I want to ask, did you design that for a play or for some kind of, um, or just the experience? No, just like you had it. Oh, my. She could be good in batch construction, so uh -huh. she could use a pattern to construct something. And that's what she chose. Um, a little bit about insider information on Alice's personality is the students, she practiced her presentation a lot in front of her classmates. And one class that she presented in front of, they said, well, where would you wear something like this? And she's just like, like on a Tuesday. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. She rocked it at school. It was great. All the kids were really excited to see it. So, oh yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Yeah, it's valid. Okay. Thank you.
this year and requires two public hearings. We had the first public hearing on March 25th. We had one guest uh, attend and ask some questions. And so this is kind of the second half of this new process. Um, a lot of these slides you saw before, so we're going to go through them pretty fast. Uh, public hearing number one, which is what we did on March 25th. Um, you can go to the next slide, Levi. Um, Impact of supplemental state aid, as we talked about on March 25th, we didn't yet know what supplemental state aid was going to be. We were hoping for 3%. We ended up getting 2%, 2.5%, sorry. Um, so our budget guarantee amount um, is 89615 but our new money is still at 155563 uh, because we are still on the budget guarantee. That SSA was signed into law on March 27th. Our certified budget is due for me. Next slide. This is a uh, review also. If you remember, we published for our first public hearing at 0% because we didn't know what we were getting. And so that property tax rate, um, the proposed property tax dollars was about $11.7 million with a rate of $17.25. What we are actually um, have on our second hearing is the 2.5% that was signed into law. So our property tax dollar levy will be about just about 11.3 million, and that comes in at a rate of 16.68 approximately. This would be a 13 cent increase over um, our current rate of 16.55. You go to the next slide. Although there is an increase in the rate, um, the liability per thousand is actually down because there was a, a change in the residential rollback. So less of your assessed value is actually taxable. So even though we're proposing um, a 13 cent increase in the rate and the total property tax dollars, the liability per, per resident is going to be down about 14%. There are several provisions, uh, several calculations that have been added to the foundation formula over time that provide additional property tax relief for us. So I always like to, um, after we know what our numbers are, um, bring those to your attention so you know that we are actually um, getting some help from the state, all these property tax uh, cuts that are being made. Um, they are backfilling with state aid in some of these areas. There's four areas that we're probably are getting property tax relief. Um, these this slide just kind of tells you what each of those are. But if you go to the next slide, for fiscal 25, our pro property tax relief provisions come to about a dollar forty-seven per thousand. So without those relief provisions, our tax rate would be right around eighteen fifteen. And then again, a reminder, we've seen this before and talked about this before, but we just want to make sure that, you know, everybody understands we are one piece of a consolidated, consolidated tax rate. There are several other levying authorities um, in our district. So this would be an example of, for someone who is a resident of the city of Boone and lives in the Boone School District. Now, the property tax statements that were mailed out um, by the county auditor, those statements only included the city, the school, and the county. They did not include any information on the other levy authorities. So this is actually the document for hearing number two that we had to publish in the newspaper. Um, and this is what you are, this is our proposed school budget summary for fiscal 25. This is what you are approving here tonight. 
Uh, what this document does, it takes um, all of our funds and it puts them together. You know how we talk so much about how we have all these individual standalone funds for this document, all of those funds are rolled in together. And so like the actual 2023 column, that is all of our funds, revenues and expenses all added together. We then re-estimate what our, we think our ending fund balance is going to be for fiscal 24, and then we project and, and do our budget for fiscal 25. So what you are certifying here tonight um, is our summary and, and these, uh, the formal legal budgetary control for our certified budget is just based on four um, classes four major classes of expenditures known as uh, functions and not by fund. So I highlighted those four functions in green. Um, those are the uh, functions of instruction, support services, non-instructional programs, and total expenditures. That's what our legal budget authority is on. And uh, if you remember, there's a report that we see every month that tells us what our expenses to our published budget is. So that's what we're monitoring there during the year. So we have those four areas. So we are certifying that we will not spend any more than 39,380 if you look at line 39, uh, $41,380,127 uh, for fiscal 25, and that's a proposed property tax rate of 1668. I think it's really hard to look at all of those funds all swished together. So I like to break them out uh, and look at that uh, by fund, like we typically look at things. So this will be just our re-estimated budget for fiscal 24, where we think we're going to end the year at. And then for fiscal 25 by fund, what our revenues and expenditures and estimated any fund balance will be for the end of fiscal 25. Any questions or videos? Any concern on the estimated ending balances of the direction some of those are heading? Um, there are some things that we are concerned about um, when looking at some budget projections. Uh, there's just so many unknowns right now. It's hard to do long range budgeting, um, but we're gonna, we'll have a work session um, here in a couple weeks or so and talk in more depth about um, some of those projections. Is there a motion? Approve the FY25 certified budget property tax rate. Move to approve the fiscal 25 certified budget and property tax rates of 16.68254. Is there a second? Second. Move in a second that to recommend approval of proposed FY25 certified budget and property tax rate of 16.68254. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No? Okay. The ayes have it. And on to surplus letter resolution. So you want to go through this? Okay. Um, so this is a resolution. If you remember when we talked about um, when we worked on setting uh, the tax rate or discussing the tax rate, <clears throat> we can pre levy for $375,000 in payoffs and debt early, which would result in an interest cost savings of $97,500. So um, we have proposed to do that, and this is just the formal resolution um, allowing us to do that. Is there a motion to do so? Yeah, a motion to approve the uh, resolution as presented. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the resolution as presented. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no? Yeah, I have it. Escrow agent agreement. And this is in um, in relation to that, we have we're amending our escrow agent agreement. Um, when the time comes, they will um, hold that money in escrow for us until the following state. Yeah, that's our motion to approve that. We move to approve the escrow agent agreement. Our second. 
So I moved and seconded to approve the escrow arrangement with agent agreement as presented. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Ayes have it. Public hearing for FY24 budget amendment. Yeah, so our budget amendments for this year have to be done by May 31st. So we would like to set a public hearing for our May meeting, which is on May 13th at 6.30 p.m. And we'll get that published and have the public hearing at that time. So our motion to do so. So moved. So second? Second. But moved and seconded to set a public hearing for the FY24 certified budget amendment for Monday, May 13th at 6.30, 6.30 p.m. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Ayes have it. Now we're on the middle school interactive TV bids. Let Levi go ahead and speak to this piece. So this will be... Um, Putting in the TVs in the middle school, just like we've done at Franklin last summer, two summers ago, and then like there's a street look the new building letters in our streets. So same concept, taking out the projectors out of the rooms, putting in touch screen interactive TVs. Um, we got bids from both CEW and Best Buy CEWs who we sourced them through previously, and they were the lowest bidder again. Um, so we recommend to go with CEW. Move to approve the middle school interactive TV uh, to the CDW. 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 Sorry. Second. Second. Yeah. Second. Second. <laughs> yes, we moved and seconded to approve. Oh, right. Okay. So approve the um, interactive TV, TV bids to CDWG. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Yeah, it's average. Okay, Brooke. Middle school English language arts update. Yeah, so this is not an action item, but we wanted to um, let Scott just um, or Jill share a little bit about just some schedule changes that we're trying to do um, with regard to language arts program. You can share schedule and I'll pipe that on curriculum. Okay. We've been working on uh, over the past year some changes within our uh, reading and language arts programs. And so uh, one of the things that we started working with was um, just trying to align our work a little closer. While we've had them separated for longer than I've been here, um, sometimes last year, last year, two years ago, we started a K-12 vertical effort, effort to look at where we were at, what content we were covering, how it aligned, uh, trying to do what was best K-12. And in that found several holes, I guess, in places where sometimes it might be like, well, reading thinks language arts is doing it, language arts thinks reading is doing it. And then we've had a few gaps of not sure who does it. So, um, our goal this year, as we started the year, was to make sure that uh, they aligned their work a little better rather than being totally independent. Um, the intent was really just reading should know what language arts is doing and vice versa. And at that point, uh, we weren't talking about a consolidation of the two. Um, as they quickly started doing that work, um, they quickly came to the decision that it was hard to separate that and uh, been highlighting a little bit with some common core uh, curriculum this year and some units. So as they would plan those out, like reading might be to a certain place, language arts, when they're done, they're taking off, and then if they got behind, they would wait maybe three days before they finished, before the next group could start. And what I thought would be a conversation a couple of years down the road was probably two or three weeks down the road. Um, and so really, I think they started thinking I was forcing them to combine. And I said, I'm not doing that unless the team comes together and we sit down and have discussed reasons why and what, what that might look like and will help facilitate that change. And then two weeks later, like I said, they came and said, this doesn't make sense that we have to be separated. 
is probably what's best for students and what's best for teaching uh, for the content to be able to know what your kids are. So in that setting, when they decided that, we uh, quickly started looking at scheduling what that might look like. And their first request was to make sure that we didn't go from a 40 minute block of reading and a 40 minute block of language. So 80 minutes to just a 40 minute block. And now you need to do both. Um, they still wanted to make sure that they had that that time together. Um, so that's our intent moving forward as we're working on the schedule. Um, it's still having an 80 minute block of ELA, uh, which now is just the ELA instead of reading or uh, language arts. So um, we've got some things in place. We're piloting some curriculum. Uh, they trialed a couple of units this year. Um, I think they like Common Core. Um, it really sets up everything that needs to be done from instruction and assessments. Um, but I think we're still going to maybe continue to pilot that a little bit more throughout this year to make sure that's um, the curriculum that we want to use. So we've kind of divvied up who's going to be teaching what and then trying to schedule that in a block scenario. So if each of the teachers had three blocks, that block could technically be back to back or with the, they'll have the same students, but there also might be a separation. And if you could have first and second hour, or you could have kids first hour and then you might have plan time and then have the same kids third hour. So you'd still have them for 40 minutes in that block time frame. And so there was a little concern earlier on that people like middle school is going to a block schedule. Um, so when we talk block in that sense, we're making sure that the students are blocked um, with the same teacher and in the same class. So when they go from first hour to third hour or fourth hour to sixth hour, um, it's hard to leave off one class where another one started off, or if you're doing interventions based on your students, it's hard to intermix those classes and then A to B is totally different kids. So that's been a, a goal that we're working towards with scheduling. So uh, with ELA, we are going to technically block those sections um, and then combine for uh, fifth through eighth grade. So currently right now, it's not blocked in elementary and it's not, it's not separated in elementary and it's not separated in high school. So we've been the weird one in the middle that's <laughs> kept it separated. It's hard to find anywhere that keeps it separated anymore. I don't know if that was a trap. At that point. I think maybe we thought the intent was like, if you're just teaching one subject area that you're focused on one uh, versus another, but really those content areas are meant to be separated. You really need both go hand in hand and it makes sense to be um, utilizing the resources that they are and the, the writing. If we're reading out of this text, then we're writing examples out of the same thing and not having two separate things. So I think it's a, in a quick couple of weeks, um, they came to that decision. So we're just trying to support them through that decision. The best for students. Yes, I recall you you approved a pilot of a common like curriculum to use at the at the middle school this school year, and we are bringing that here for adoption because we don't feel like we really ran it through the true curriculum adoption process. Um, the structure wasn't in place to really do that well, and so the teachers would like to try all that curriculum again next year with the structure in place. Um, I don't know if the curriculum helped encourage them to want to come to that sooner or not, because they saw how it. Uh, some resources might blend the two, it became really hard to teach it separate. And so uh, we'd like to pilot that again next year and look at some other curriculum pieces. Um, our, our goal was to really look at 512 ELA curriculum resources and adoption this school year. Um, we're kind of continue to pause that as we shift some things here at the middle school. And then um, ideally we were planning to look at K4 or TK4 in the next school year. Um, but our TK4 team has, uh, embarked on some really in-depth learning. Uh, it's called letters and there's a lot of uh, talk about that. The state is providing some opportunities for that really in-depth um, learning about teaching uh, reading and how kids learn to read. But uh, that training is a two-year commitment. And so our elementary staff are currently committed to that. And, and we don't want to adopt new materials while we're just beginning the learning that might really guide something meaningful to help support us in teaching that. So pushing back everything um, an additional year and lets us be really thoughtful and make sure things align and that we're not just selecting things in a hurry um, simply because it's due. And it, and it is due, so we we're looking for ways to support our teachers in the meantime, but at the same time, make sure that what um, we do end up purchasing is really thoughtful and the structures allow them to do that, the structures on the learning line. 
we were able to run a couple of finalists this year. So we had a five, six uh, team with Gabriel Patterson and uh, Megan Kelly that were kind of co-teaching reading and language arts together. So they were working together on that end. Um, and then the same on the other end was uh, Maddie Hughes and Keith Lehman at the seven eight, um, looking at the combination of those of those two areas. So that's kind of what they've been. We've had most of our planning since about winter break uh, was about shortly when we made that decision to do that. Most of their uh, PD has been around aligning those and combining the two areas and starting to look at how they're going to do them. So I think from a board perspective. The only thing you might hear from parents is why does it say ELA twice? And it's just because it's no longer separated. Our my other child, child had reading and language, but now this child has two blocks of ELA. Right. Like, what's that what mean? So just so you know that that's what it is, and you know why it's that way. And yeah. Be that way next year, then? Is that the yes. plan? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Any other questions? I'll keep you in the loop. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, girls wrestling was sanctioned by the Iowa Girls Athletic Association. Uh, a couple of years back, and uh, district and board supported that move uh, to create our own team. Uh, we had great representation um, from our district. We had uh, 11 girls this year in high school. And uh, as you probably heard, girls wrestling uh, has um, grown in popularity throughout the state. Um, well, they're selling out the first day uh, at Coral Bell for the state tournament. Um, High attendance at regional sites. Um, I think we're fortunate to have a couple of girls go uh, represent us at state the last couple of years. Um, they're even talking uh, currently in uh, the advisory council for that sport to split into two classes. So it's grown in two classes. Um, so it's grown exponentially in um, the last couple of years. And so with that comes um, some decision making that has um, been put on schools is how do we how do we continue to support the growth of that? That program. Um, and we've been fortunate to have two really good head coaches in York over 10 and uh, Josh Atwa um, the last couple of years. Um, we, we've seen um, where our growth has is, kind is of stopped a little bit at the middle school level. And uh, looking at that, and we've had discussions within our conference AD um, uh, committees um, talking about uh, what we can do to continue to build a 712 program. Um, one thing that we're seeing is uh, it is kind of that equity piece where um, some of the great wrestling is offered uh, before winter break uh, during the same time as uh, some of the great girls basketball, uh, whereas some of the boys basketball is offered after winter break and then it's split, um, but not necessarily uh, anything for the girls. And so uh, within our conference and some of the concerns uh, are noted up there. Uh, you know, lack of comfort a little bit in a, in a room of 20 to 25 boys. Uh, you know, since we have adopted a full girls program, our girls uh, can only compete against other girls. So sometimes when we go to eats, there's no matches for them uh, if there aren't any girls competing. So, um, you know, and it's something to to keep in mind too, is we are building a program of that transition between middle school and high school. Because we have that girls program, middle school and high school, um, can at times um, practice together, but the logistics of, of taking them from middle school to high school or to crossroads gets a little complicated. Um, and so uh, our conference, um, along with the Heart of Iowa conference, um, I, think, I believe the Heart of Iowa conference has already moved to that for this year, that girls wrestling will be offered after winter break. Um, it, with girls basketball being offered before winter break, kind of mirroring the boys' seasons. Um, and uh, our conference, all of our schools are looking to move towards that um, for the 24 25 uh, school year uh, to be able to offer that and give girls an opportunity to try out basketball, try out wrestling. Um, from what I understand, we had a couple of the girls participate in middle school girls wrestling this year. We would have had a couple more had it not had it been opposite 
of uh, girls basketball. And so there's that also that equity piece that, that you want to be aware of too with Title IX. Uh, are we operating the same access and opportunities to both our boys and girls? Um, and at the middle school level, that's an opportunity for them to try different things and see what they like. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of helps also with the continuity of our programs, um, you know, move it to uh, for our conferences, because we don't really want to get into a place where we're the only school in our conference that offers it before winter break, and then you have nobody to wrestle. Um, we're kind of at the point where we're looking at schedules for next fall and next winter, uh, and trying to develop a schedule for middle school girls wrestling possibly after winter break. So just kind of needing the permission. Um, you know, and obviously something that is absorbed um, financially by the, the girls program. You know, we, we can always go to district club to help support that. But I think what what I would be requesting from board is basically permission to move in that direction uh, to create a schedule. Um, you know, we have that option. We're fortunate to have a, a middle school wrestling room um, as well as high school wrestling room at our high school girls practice at Crossroads too, because we have that facility. Um, what I'd be asking again is permission to do that, um, but also um, a site and payment to work to one one being a girls coach that could be right there working with our girls, um, but also kind of a transitional coach, assistant coach to help out at the middle school and to help out coach at well at the high school. One of the things about wrestling is there's typically multiple mats at each meet or each tournament. Sometimes you can't dictate. Um, where our participants are going to wrestle. So, so, so it's vital to really have an additional coach there because they may be split on that to have somebody in their corner. Uh, and just with the growth too, because I think we're, we're gonna see numbers grow at the high school as well, when the kids are not even out. So um, having that support would be uh, being able to have a level person there is we're kind of working with volunteers right now. Any questions? Scott, do you have anything to add? <laughs> oh, I, think it makes, I think it makes sense to have the set. I think that will bring the numbers, you know, to have the separate time that they're able to do it. I don't think in the time that I've seen from the boys at the middle, middle school since we separated, I mean, if you've ever seen a wrestler play basketball, it's not very good usually. Now, I'm not saying that there's not some wrestlers that can't play basketball, but I think I, we've never seen, like, we don't have kids doing both wrestling and basketball. And I really thought that would be a big choice to be like, oh, and even in middle school, let's try out both. And that may move those numbers going into high school. But typically at that point, you know, like every other sport, like wrestling starts like when you're two. Um, so by the time you're in seventh grade, you've been wrestling for a long time and going to tournaments. And sometimes if you're jumping in that late, you're as I recall, men wrestle with boys. So, you know, if I, you, you might, you might, you might at some point get a few students that try out most sports, but like typically that's not the experience I've seen with the middle school boys of having increase in the numbers because we split the seasons to allow them to do both. So there might be a, a student here or there that chooses to do that. But, I think the numbers will go up just having a separate time and space, a way to do that and provide them that support of the means to be able to always get to wrestle. And you're checking your compatibility with our other conference people to see how this works. Yeah. Right. So um, all of our current conference moments are making this move this year, and then the Heart of Iowa, which is um, conference that we uh, received the invitation from, there are, they've already made that okay. So there would be competitions for our kids all the time. I was commenting, I think it makes total sense, quite frankly, as we continue to want to continue to grow that, I think it just, that is the next evolution of the step. So. So this is an accident. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's like that for so many years. I move to approve the two coaching positions and move forward with the presentation that was presented. Yeah, so I got that one. I moved and approved to uh, move forward with scheduling and for the stipends for the positions. Any discussion? Do you have a couple people in mind for those positions at this point? Yeah, we'll have to work through the um, posting of it and the hiring process, but um, we have a young lady. Um, that helps volunteer at the middle school that works with some of those kids and even gave them some opportunities to go to tournaments and have their operation with personal risks. So, we can't, uh, we have a young lady who's also up and out high school program that um, has been in a lot of fun already. So, there's, there's some options there. I have to ask about money. Oh. Thank you. Money for these positions. We find money for these positions. We're in great financial health today. We can't make any promises. <laughs> Fine thing. Fine thing. I think it's a good day to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's money this year. Money this year. <laughs> any other questions? Okay. All in favor say aye. Okay. Aye. aye. Both now? Yeah, I said it. Abrupt and setting a work session. Yes, so we need to set a work session um, for facilities assessment. Um, given what they said to us this evening, we might want to be looking at a different date. <laughs> and it's going to take a couple of weeks to get the actual full report. Yeah, um, I think so too. But maybe do we want to at least come up with an idea? So yeah, but so yeah. yeah, but it's going to have to be. I I think we we want to try to couple it with the paper date and do it before. Do you want to do it on a separate date? That would be my question. May thirteenth is next regularly scheduled time that we be together. Um, we could do it five o'clock. I do have an hour and a half, so right? A work session on May 20th. We do have a work session on May 20th. Oh, right. Right. On the 20th. Right, the 20th. Okay, yeah, there's also one on the 20th. So we have the 13th and the 20th. We could do either of those at different times, you know, at a time different than what's already scheduled. Trying to look better. Okay. How's the 20th sound to everyone? <laughs> like after the um, annual goal review meeting? The goal review meeting shouldn't take long, I think. We got to set a time for the work session. So that's why I'm trying to figure out what a good time because I don't want us to just sit for half an hour and wait. <laughs> but I also don't want, you know what I mean? We could set them both at five and do, do one after another. Yeah. Do okay. One so, after another. so just plan to stay longer that night than an hour. <laughs> so if we do them both on the 20th and we start, I think the annual goal review for, um, work session will be not long. I think the more lengthy meeting would be the work session on facilities. But then that would give us more time with the documents once we get them. You would have more time to look through those so that when we're together, you would have the ability to have more questions, comments, etc. So we'll plan on May 20th for the work session for the facilities. Okay. And then um, we also need to do a work session for budget projections. And we had just wanted to do that sooner or later. So we were throwing out the idea of the 18th, but I know that didn't work for everyone on the board. So unless it was later than five. So I don't know where the rest of you were with that date or if there's a different date that's better, but we would like to have the budget work session, projection and work session prior to the facilities conversation. So you have some sense of what that looks like as well.
So that I heard from one person that said the earliest they'd be able to do would be six o'clock on the 18th. I don't know if that's still even very good for them. So I'm looking for other ideas. Which 6 30 on the 18th floor? Yeah, what happened later would be best for me if we do it on the 18th. That's this week, so like as of Thursday. <laughs> Does that work for everyone to do 6 30? Okay, our next sub is committee assignments. So you have a summary of all the different committees there. There are some that are required by IRA code, others that are not. Those were um, specifically stated by each uh, committee, whether they're required by code and which ones are not. The vast majority that are listed in that list are simply kind of as needed informal committees. They aren't committees that meet on a regular basis by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but we had not done that yet since we've had the new makeup of our, of our board. So we thought we should probably um, update and share with all of you where you're assigned, make sure you're all good with those assignments, and then um, have an actual motion to approve those uh, assignments. Doesn't have the names for the school improvement advisory council or curriculum here. We've already done those. Those were already yeah. approved okay, good. in September. Okay, good. So that's right. So as you can see, finance audit committee would be Pam and I as present vice president. Academic programs that have been Pam and I in the past, uh, looking at any curriculum changes, curriculum adoption, board policy. Scott Brian and. Matt, facilities, Jeremy and Brian. Uh, ISB delegate, it's been me, but if somebody else would like to do it at the IASB convention, that is welcome. Uh, Bill County Conference Board, I did it this year. Again, if somebody else would like to do that, that is fine for me. Uh, building a better Boone City leadership, that again was me this year. That's been me. And then negotiations have been man pan. Suggested changes. It's okay. Let's go for now. I mean, I know something we have to change. We just need a motion and motion to approve those. Well, to approve the committee assignments as discussed. Is there a second? Second. Move and second to approve the committees that was presented. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. I said. Okay, we're going to out of state travel. Yes, so we have two out of state travel requests. One is for our four school nurses to attend the National Association of School Nurses Conference in Chicago. Um, it has been 10 years since nurses have attended anything like this so i think um, we do have a, a new nurse on the team and and they're due for being able to have some professional development uh, you can see the costs that are associated um, i know that they do plan to take a history ban you know, as long as there's one available and try and reduce the number of hotel rooms obviously things like that but that is one of the requests for that conference. And then the other one is for our food service director to attend this School Nutrition Association annual conference. Um, that was approved last year for previous food service directors who ended up not um, going. So this would not be an annual event, but again, something that they would attend and then have kind of several years before they would attend again. But those were the two. Request PD funds would um, cover the cost of the school nurses attending, and our nutrition fund has uh, the funds to uh, cover any um, costs associated with the food service. So, those are the two being recommended for out of state travel. Okay. Our motion. I move to approve out of state travel for our nutrition staff service. Our second. Second. 
I moved and seconded to approve uh, out of state travel for school nurses and for the food service director. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. I have had it. Off the board policy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we were going to discuss the discussion. Yeah, right. Oh, that's right. Okay. But since Matt and Ryan are just approved for the committee, to help <laughs> each other. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so, we are required by law to review our entire, all of our board policies once every five years. We actually do have a board policy saying that we'll do one fifth of the policy manual annually um, and divides it down there for you. Uh, so we're just looking for some input as to how you would like to do this. You can, we can just do it in one big chunk once a year, or we can spread it out and do a couple, you know, every meeting during the year. Uh, so that by the end of the year, you've, you've done the whole series. Um, we can have all board members take a turn in reviewing sections or just the two that are yeah, what we'd like to do. <laughs> and, well, I would say, due to my uh, personal life and my work life, I don't want to do it all at once. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I like the idea of spreading that out throughout and have us improve some of that as. Meetings go. Okay. I don't want to speak for you. Yeah, yeah. that's my take on yep. it. So, agree. I also like the idea of assigning what person each month to to, re to review and make any suggestions, so that like you know June it's you, July it's you, you know whatever you're reading, maybe four or five in detail in detail to be able to share back with the group. I like that idea so that not. Everybody and that will be to like you're time. totally left to your own to do no. that. I mean, we no. do it yeah. yeah. by yeah. guidance right. recommendations right. from IASB. We can answer yes. questions. So, yeah. Yeah. You're not totally. And the rest of us can read them. The rest of us can read them, but we wouldn't be picking up part of that. Right. Makes sense. I'm just going to start this from next month or next fall. We should start next month. <laughs> yeah, we've got, we got some work to do. Um, okay. And, yeah. Um, let's plan on you. And do the 200s. We did that more recently. Yeah, I was so excited. Yeah. Well, we'll get a plan yeah. together. Okay. We'll put a plan together for May for you to look at, and then okay. that way. Yeah. It's not a right with everybody. It's not an action item. No, no, just looking for some input. That's not like a good deal. How to yeah, and then I find it's going to be a video big. Some of the policies are already giving me sneak more. Yeah, yeah. Super long ones. Yeah, they're real yeah. short ones. Yeah. And and one person assigned to yeah. detail review for that one. The, the issue. Uh, the issue at hand is that there are so many cross references. In the majority of the policies. So if you change something in this policy, it might impact another policy that's maybe not on cycle to be reviewed. It's just like going down a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, so even if Sabre is taking this 500 series and that's what, where our focus was, it's entirely possible that we would have to adopt some in the 300 series because yeah. of the cross references. So Makes sense. that's all that. Okay. Yeah, so just a couple of reminders. Um, we do have the annual goal review um, meeting on the 20th at 5. And then um, we have a United. So in our agreement with United schools, um, we are supposed to have a joint board meeting. And it has not always been annually, but there is a uh, new sheriff superintendent, and they would like to have that annual meeting um, would take place here um, this time um, on 30th at 6. I do know we have one member that's not available, 
our board, but as long as we have a quorum, we could move forward. So I just need to make sure that we would have that, that we would have at least three of you able to make that April 30th date at six. And um, when we asked about the agenda item, essentially they just want to make sure we're reviewing our agreement. They, it will end in 2027, and I think they're anticipating um, what that might look like before in 2027. So I think that might be part of the conversation. So I was the one that had a conflict, but I would ask. I think last time I went to a joint one with them, we went there. So yeah, they're yeah, going to yeah. come here this yeah, time. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to come here this time. Give you a little that night. Six. It's kind of the way my schedule's running okay. too about every board meeting. I'm kind of the coach. It's not much of a game if you don't show up. <laughs> and then the only other thing that you might have to ask for is if we had any um, data that let them know how their students were performing, whether it's on ACC or yeah. yeah, exactly. But it's hard sometimes to tease that out if we don't always know who's who. So we'll do our best. <laughs> To well, try to do that, but are you going to look for some alternative dates? Can they well, just give us a list of things? Who could be, be here that way? Can you be here? I think, yeah, I can be here. Okay, so three of us. We have it. We have it for Are you two okay with this meeting for us without you? That's just a more of an informational meeting, right? Yes. There's yes. no really action stuff in that aspect, which I think could be recorded. Not that we're aware of. <laughs> Going into it, going into it, I think it's just a conversation about our agreement and if everyone's okay with how it's been going. Um, unless there's something uh, that, you, that you really want to bring up that we need to make sure we can kind of constantly have to rearrange. And I'm fine with the three go on that. I don't have an issue with that. The only issue that's come up lately is the bus, right? Yeah, and I think they have that corrected now. <laughs> so. Yeah, anything else? Nothing else for my section. Okay, yeah, we're going to take a little bit of break then, and we will go into 47. Take that break. I'm just walking around the session.